Okay, hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll be, we'll start in a few minutes. Okay, um, so welcome, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this event titled Point to Point, Art and Digital Connectivity. I'm Boots Herrera, Director and Chief Curator of the Ateneo Art Gallery. This online event um, is meant to mark the 10th year of the Purita Kahlo Ledesma Crisis in Art Criticism. We have been very fortunate to work with the Kahlo Ledesma Foundation um, for the past 10 years. And this program has allowed more art writers to participate in the art, local art scene, and even um, in international with international publications. So, um, and these are writers who um, won or uh, were all were shortlisted for the past ten years. We have also increased our partners, partners, publication partners. We started with the Philippine Star and. Um, Art Asia Pacific joined as publication partner after, I think it was in the fourth year. And uh, two years ago, we were able to confirm a part, uh, publication partner in Filipino. And so since then, we have, um, uh, we, we created the Filipino uh, category as part of the Purita Kahlo de Desmo Prizes in Art Criticism. So uh, I'd like to call on Nana Osaita, president of the Kahlo de Desma Foundation for her message before we proceed with the program proper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boots. Uh, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of the Kahlo de Desma Foundation, welcome to the first in our series of talks focusing on the state and relevance of art criticism today. Together with the Ateneo Art Gallery, we decided to mount this series of talks because 2023 happens to be a momentous year for us. It will be the 10th anniversary of the Purita Kahlo de Desma Prizes in Art Criticism, which has been held every year since 2014 as part of the Ateneo Art Awards. So after a decade, what better time than now to discuss and assess the role and significance of art criticism in the context of the ever-evolving Philippine art landscape? About 10 years ago, we partnered with the Ateneo Art Gallery to revive a project started by our founder and my grandmother, Purita Kahlo de Desma, back in 1991. We decided to re revive this prize as a way to posthumously honor her for her vital contributions to Philippine art. We were also inspired by her belief that art criticism, an art criticism that is dynamic, engaged, and independent, is a necessary discipline for the Philippine art scene to flourish and mature. Indeed, since we started the, the Purita Kahlo de Desma, or PKL prizes, we've had the privilege of reading hundreds of entries that are dynamic, engaged, and independent in spirit, exhibiting a multiplicity of viewpoints and experiences. From 2014 to 2022, we've congratulated a total of 62 prize winners and shortlisted writers writing in both English and Filipino. Many of them continue to engage with the art world as critics, curators, academics, researchers, journalists, cultural workers, and the like. And we'll soon be deliberating on this year's 10th batch of entries with the PKL prizes to be awarded later this year. Together with Ateneo Art Gallery, I'm very proud to be presenting today's talk, Point to Point, Art and Digital Connectivity, in commemoration of the PKL Prize's 10th anniversary. I am especially proud because two of our speakers, Carla Gamalinda and Christine De Leon, are PKL Prize winners themselves. But I'm also proud because we are continuing to do what we set out to do 10 years ago, to help provide opportunities for our writers to share their ideas, to question and critique what they observe, and by extension, to enrich our understanding of and engagement with the Philippine art and Filipino artists. Thank you to our esteemed speakers, the Ateneo Art Gallery, and our media partners, the Philippine Star, 
Katipunan Journal, and Art Asia Pacific, represented by our speaker today, HG Masters. Thank you as well to our residency partner, The Orange Project, for the continued support. Through the PKL prizes and events such as this one, I look forward to encouraging more writers to continue observing, analyzing, opining, and provoking the art world for the next 10 years and beyond. Speaking of a writer who's been doing just that, I'm happy and proud to introduce Portia Placino, our moderator for today's talk. Portia happens to be a recipient herself of the Purita Kahlo Ledesma Prize in Art Criticism in 2021. She's an arts writer and educator who contributes to Art Asia Pacific, Art Plus, and Spotlight PH, and has published in various peer-reviewed journals and books. She has also done a writing fellowship for Critica and a research fellowship at the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Korea. In her recent projects, she contemplates the position and influence of contemporary art, new media, art history, and theory in an embattled and oppressed society. And she strives to create critical and discursive spaces on regional art practices across the Philippines. Please welcome Portia Vecino. Um, thank you, Nana, for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. So I will be the moderator um, this afternoon, and we have four speakers, Verami from Southeast of Now, HG Masters from Art Asia Pacific, and um, our respondents, Christine De Leon and Carla Gamadinda. So to begin, uh, I'll introduce our first speaker, Vera Lee is an independent curator and final year PhD candidate at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She is currently guest professor in art history and curatorial studies at Stadish in Frankfurt. Uh, her doctoral research unpacks modern Southeast Asian art during the Cold War eras in Cambodia, Indonesia, and Singapore, paying particular attention to intersections of racial plurality with regionalism. Prior to this, she worked as a curator, both institutionally and independently, predominantly with artists with a revisionist approach to history. Mako founded a the peer-reviewed scholarly journal Southeast of Now, Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art in Asia, which is open access online and available in print. Um, Verami. Hello, good morning. Thank you so much for the generous introduction and also thank you so much for the Ateneo Art Gallery uh, for having me here and everyone who um, assisted in the preparations and to congratulate you on this 10-year anniversary of a very important prize. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful to see how uh, art criticism is being fostered and actively um, nurtured. Um, I know it's often, I think criticism gets quite a um, bad rap sometimes, you know, um, and it's it's great to see that it's um, very much encouraged within this context. I am just going to share my screen. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Here we go. Okay, great. Uh, so um, as mentioned, I am one of the co-founding um, editorial collectives of a journal called Southeast of Now. Uh, I thought I would present this uh, as a way to think about uh, art criticism and the writing of art and art history. Uh, I feel a little bit um, shy in terms of connecting to the theme of art and digital connectivity, in part because I think the journal, although it has an online presence, it's also quite um, somewhat stubbornly analog. So we also um, have a print issue. So Southeast of Now, uh, which is called, uh, which has a subtitle of Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art in Asia, actually began as a conversation which emerged in uh, 2014. And it took a few years for our first print issue to be released, which was actually in 2016. It's a uh, peer review scholarly journal, which is hosted out of our wonderful publishers at NUS Press. And uh, the reason why I'm showing you our two different logos here is because it actually started out uh, just called Southeast of Now, Directions in Contemporary and Modern Art. 
And part of the reasons why we had to share the um, in Asia um, part of uh, the title is because we needed to make it uh, easily searchable and indexed uh, for online journal usage in terms of the academic university system. And so that people could understand, yeah, we, we wanted to be a little bit more ambiguous in terms of how we connected to Southeast Asia and Asia, hence the sort of title Southeast of now. We didn't want to be too definitive, but the demands of being uh, easily accessible in terms of searches online so, sort of meant that we had to adjust in terms of our title. From the outset, Southeast of now always, I guess, had a remit of being uh, an academic journal. And that's partly as well because we wanted to for the journal to have a life beyond its editors so that it could continue without the people who founded it, um, that it wasn't necessarily tied to our sort of personalities or specific research interests in, as individuals, but actually that it would serve as a platform, uh, you know, which other people as later generations of um, scholars come through uh, could run with and, and take on themselves. Um, so as you'll see here, our founding members has grown into our current editorial collective. So we've grown in size um, and, you know, and sort of the resource power that we need to, to function. Um, and that also we have uh, advisors that are, are located within um, the university system. Uh, obviously, there are issues with the whole process of a peer review articles and um, and the whole issue of uh, scholarship as being sort of behind a paywall online. So from the outset as well, we've partnered with NUS Press so that we could provide um, the journal as an open access uh, platform. Uh, and another thing we were responding to, I guess, is that we saw a lot of uh, platforms for art writing, art historical writing and art criticism emerge in the region, but a lot of them did not necessarily have longevity. Uh, and were not necessarily recognized um, within the wider academic sphere. And as much as we recognize it's problematic, we also wanted to sort of highlight and profile you know, the really important work that our scholars are doing within the region and sort of have them circulate amongst um, the academic, you know, the, the best versions of academic publishing available online. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Southeast of Now began as a conversation between a few of the uh, editorial collective members and myself. When we were um, in Cambodia, I, I was part of a um, itinerant residency that we set up. And these issues around platforms for cross-regional criticism um, really came up that we were thinking about something more specific to issues in Southeast Asia in particular. And somewhere where emerging and established scholars from the region could meet and converse with each other um, as a mode of encounter, um, which is why I guess I've used this image from that residency <laughs> to, to think about the past and the present. And the reason as well why we incorporated the terms modern and contemporary, um, except we kind of flipped it. So we talked about, you know, the subtitle as directions of contemporary and modern art in Asia, because we didn't want to necessarily place a hierarchy on the time precedent and that we know that those terms within a Southeast Asian context are kind of up for debate. So um, we wanted to have a dialogue, enable a platform that had a dialogue with both modern contemporary art um, and an amorphous idea of the region as it's not necessarily bound to specific countries, but to, I guess, a Southeast state, uh, state of mind of thinking. Since that initial, uh, the initial journal in 20, um, 20, uh, 16, 2015, I believe, we have published um, at least two per year, um, with the exception of 2020, when we had sort of a double issue, uh, which is really amazing for us to think about and reflect upon in terms of um, how we have been able to sustain throughout those years and get enough peer review articles. So during the process of peer review, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, an article is submitted by a scholar and then it goes through um, a process where it's uh, blindly looked at by two established and emerging scholars uh, who are experts on the topic at hand. And they then uh, look at the article, assess the article for its sort of um, scholarly potential and contribution. And then they provide comments um, usually to the author, which are then edited and then um, 
sort of assessed for its academic merit and then goes through that process of editing and approval before being published online. We publish those peer review articles alongside short responses, artist pages, um, exhibition and book reviews and so forth. So from the outset, I guess it was us, important for us to have um, a space where uh, academic scholarship could sit alongside more informal uh, contributions. This is an example of our online um, table of contents of one of our issues, I think our first issue actually. So um, as you can see, there are the names of the articles, but um, I hope you can see my mouse. Um, but towards the right hand side, there are also spaces for artist projects. I mean, we are limited in terms of publishing in a print format, so they don't necessarily come out as um, interesting or as beautiful. Um, but maybe that's something I think for us to think about ways to engage the digital platform more, uh, because we are very much, I guess, um, stuck to this print format, which is, I guess, one of the demands of the journal in terms of being allowed to be on this kind of um, online database that sits alongside other journals. But it, what's been really great about um, this format as well as been able to connect us to scholars in the region that we have not necessarily um, have known directly through our network. It's allowed us to connect to emerging scholars within the region and the challenge, I guess, for these scholars to produce something um, you know, worthy of, um, of academic publishing. Oh, very me. I'm sorry. Um, do you mind pressing the share this to share the slideshow so it will be bigger? We can see the text. Oh, sure. Right. Yes. Sorry. Um, uh, I think on your right, the, the slideshow. I think you can just click on the slide. Sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, Why? Yeah, so this is just a sample of some of the titles of the articles that we've published recently. Um, all of these, for example, are peer review. So really, I guess, in-depth uh, explorations of certain topics. The articles are usually between four and 6,000 words. So it really allows um, a scholar to, you know, to go in depth with their research and to express, I guess, an angle or a perspective that they're producing on the topic, which is um, really great for us. So one of the um, issues as well um, that we looked at was it allows us to look at, I guess, certain terminologies and certain issues that are topical to the region. Uh, one of those being um, an exploration here by um, scholars that uh, part of our collective, but also beyond, um, which is to look at translations of the term modern and contemporary and art in Southeast Asia's vernacular languages, which was a really big project um, undertaken by, um, yeah, by these writers and by members of our very passionate editorial collective. Uh, and, a, and I think a platform like this allows the length and allows the kind of rigor to go in depth into these issues, but also allows, I guess, a broader cross-regional um, exploration of some of the issues. So there, it was by 10 researchers, all of whom live and work in Southeast Asia and address the nine Southeast Asian languages and has been cited quite extensively by scholars within and beyond the region. We've, we see ourselves as very much in dialogue with other scholarship being produced, such as um, some of the texts here uh, who are from people that um, are, are our academic advisors, but also who uh, I guess publishing and producing pieces of um, uh, historical scholarship that we, we want to be conversant with. Uh, another, oh, sorry. Oh gosh, okay. Another aspect that we're um, really fortunate to publish because it is an academic journal and we, we do, I guess, have some sort of leeway in terms of um, what formats we can, we can push within this journal, uh, translations. That's been a really important aspect, translations into English and then English into different Southeast Asian languages at times too. And that we can publish translations of what we consider um, very interesting texts for researchers. Um, and make those available online, which I think as a researcher is a really invaluable resource as well, that we can help circulate, I guess, these kind of more raw or prime resources um, to researchers. 
So what's been quite fascinating as well is that these round of uh, we can host roundtables, which brings together different scholars from throughout the region to converse with each other. Um, this issue here from 2020 was a roundtable on teaching of the history of modern contemporary art in Southeast Asia. So it brings different scholars located in different parts of the region and different countries of the region together to converse uh, on these kind of broader themes and topics and allows for a cross-regional analysis, I think, in a way that because we have the flexibility of an academic journal, um, the length um, and the format allows. We were very surprised actually when we started um, the journal that um, the, the downloads um, in terms of being on these bigger academic publishing databases. So if you can see here, a very surprising number our downloads in 2019, which I think about three years after the journal started was around 3000. And in 2022 was um, at 94,000. I mean, that's astonishing for us um, as a kind of journal, which, you know, really um, is run by, run on the passion of um, the editorial collective and the scholars who um, produce texts for us. So it's, it's really incredible to have this kind of reach for a sort of quite a niche academic subject. 50% uh, of our readers are based in Southeast Asia, which is quite interesting, and 50% are based elsewhere. Um, I think it's probably quite noteworthy that, um, you know, 25%-ish from the United States, probably testament to sort of the regular, uh, the, sorry, abundance of academic institutions um, in the US, but also from the Philippines. So, um, you know, uh, which I think is reflective of uh, the robustness of um, different criticism coming out of the Philippines. And we've been very lucky to have a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of scholars from the Philippines as well contribute to our journal, which has been really wonderful. Um, it seems like there's a very healthy um, sense of uh, art, art historical writing and criticism. Uh, we've also been lucky to have different institutional supports and collaborations. A lot of them happen live. So this, uh, for example, idea of a sleepover on our first issue was hosted with the Reading Room in Bangkok. as well as um, that was filmed and uploaded online. I mean, I guess this is a digital aspect that we're trying to bolster. Um, and as well as the first launch of our volume, which happened um, both at the National Gallery in Singapore and at the Jim Thompson Center in Bangkok, um, where we brought together some of our um, editorial collective as long as, along with our editorial advisors uh, in conversation. So that's also been really nice, the kind of generational um, approach to the read, uh, to the journal scholarship. So um, being able to converse with scholars that we have looked up to and learn from and also being able to support those that are emerging. And one of the ways that we've been able to do that quite directly is by having an emerging writers fellowship and an emerging translators fellowship, both of whom are privately funded and patronized. Um, by some really wonderful donors that we have. Um, Christine, who's a, a respondent today, we're very, we were very lucky to have her as an emerging writer as well. So that's been also a really wonderful aspect about the journal because it is kind of formalized um, as an academic uh, platform that we are also very cognizant of our role in nurturing and supporting the next generation of scholars as well. Translation, again, I think is a, a big, um, issue in the region in terms of translating key texts from art history, but also uh, nurturing translation so that um, a lot of publishing is still retained in the region's um, languages. So I guess one last thing I wanted to, sorry, um, flag here is this, um, although we know the problematics of publishing within academia, that we also wanted to provide a space where artists could respond to issues, but also that, you know, we as an editorial collective take um, independent um, academic freedom in terms of what we publish. And that's been really wonderful because I'm sure you're aware that some of the issues within Southeast Asia is that the, the scholars and the artists um, often can publish 
uh, in neighboring countries or produce work that is exhibited in neighboring countries, but that their own um, academic environments might not necessarily uh, be so hospitable to the content. So it was also important for us to have spaces where, um, yeah, where we were independent and where we could also um, respond to certain issues within um, public discourse, but also um, issues of academic freedom. We also host guest issues as well by different um, by different scholars. So there's you know there's opportunities to have different voices within the um, the journal as well. Um, but we have yeah a lot of a lot more ambitions around what we want to do with with the journal. And I um, I think yeah our analog our you know our hard print analog format sort of maybe um, needs to be expanded. So that's something that we're trying to think about as well. Uh, but, you know, that it's been a really wonderful journey of connecting to scholars within the region and beyond. Um, and, yeah, and that we're looking forward to um, to supporting art historical writing, um, writing reviews, art criticism um, within this format that is gain garnering traction in terms of its readership. So also very welcome to receive submissions. Uh, and suggestions for articles, that kind of thing. So I hope um, that, yeah, some of you um, in participating today, um, listening to these talks would, would consider our platform as well for the future. But I think that might be my time up, if I'm correct. Yes, um, Barrett, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and for giving us context on the research and publication practice, as well as this magnificent growing readership when it comes to art criticism uh, and, you know, art research and writing in Southeast Asia. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, H.G. Masters. He is presently the deputy editor and deputy publisher of Hong Kong-based magazine Art Asia Pacific. He has also been the editor of Art Asia Pacific Almanac since 2007, which annually surveys art across 53 Asian countries. In 2010, Masters was awarded the Creative Capital Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writer Grant for short form writing. His essays and reviews have been published in magazines and journals, including Face, Even, Art Papers, Res Art World, and Portal 9. So um, thank you, HG. Thank you, Portia. It's nice to see you. And uh, of course, and uh, thank you to everyone at uh, Farita Kalala Desma Foundation, just and Ateneo for organizing this event. and. Uh, yeah, hosting us and, of course, giving time to the world of writing about art. And um, yeah, I'm actually holding a copy of uh, the current issue of AAP, our May June issue, which uh, has an article uh, by Portia on the cover. Um, Portia wrote about Imelda Capje in Daya, uh, so, which we worked on. I think we worked on this article for a few months, uh, which is a great pleasure. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, do uh, just uh, introduce Art Asia Pacific a little bit. Um, I know uh, many of you uh, will be familiar with it, but I will just oops, sorry share my screen. And yeah, so. Um, Art Asia Pacific is, uh, wow, we're 30 years old um, as a magazine, and we've had lots of uh, various incarnations. So um, the magazine was originally founded in 1993 in Australia by a group of curators there who were involved with uh, the Asia Pacific Triennial. Uh, and it was uh, originally owned and published by the uh, magazine Art and Australia. So it was a kind of spin off. Um, of that publication. But then since then, it's had uh, different lives. It migrated to New York, uh, which is where I first got involved with Art Asia Pacific. And then in 2011, uh, the current publisher, Elaine Ng, uh, relocated the magazine to Hong Kong. And I always explain that by saying 
that you know after the financial crisis um the whole center of uh energy or agency in the region uh, really shifted out of not not the region but in, in the, the art world shifted out of new york uh, there uh, New York in the late 2000s, there were big Indian, Chinese, Korean galleries that were very active, and uh, and then uh, they all relocated back to their home countries, and then a place like Hong Kong became this kind of uh, meeting point, let's say, in, in Asia for all the international, you know, more commerce-driven part of the art world, but also, you know, the, the early conceptualization of M plus was happening, and, you know, just there were people were thinking about um, you know what it means to be based in the region in in a different way so that's why it made sense to be in hong kong and that's where we've been since then and yeah so so our main activity is really the uh six issues a year that we publish um, for our print magazine uh but uh we also uh publish uh books and we uh, so those are we sort of do those on a more ad hoc basis with different partners and collaborators, uh, everything from exhibition catalogs to anthologies of writings to more monographic books. Um, so that's been a fun kind of project. And and then also, uh, you know, we're, we're publishing every day online. Uh, so as I always tell people, we're, we're working on all these different time scales where we have like a magazine coming out every two months. Uh, we have book projects that could take you know, multiple months, even a year, maybe more. Um, and then, you know, we're also trying to publish almost every day. Um, and then, uh, so we are, are covering things like news um, and, you know, we try to line up reviews. So this is a, our homepage from earlier this week, uh, just an example. So we, um, we usually try to publish one article in Chinese every uh, week, which is uh, usually a translation from our current issue. Uh, but then we also are publishing news every day. Um, yeah, so I think at the moment we have a article of kind of preview of some exhibitions that are opening in late June. Um, yeah, so so we are uh, really in the middle of trying to deal with like what it means to publish uh, in print and also online. And you know, a lot of people. Uh, including my colleagues and, uh, of course, myself. You know, we always wonder like what the future is for publishing. What is the point of publishing? Um, I think what we do is quite uh, different than, um, and it's worth distinguishing. You know, like this format of a magazine. Um, you know, because they're, you know, of course, explained very well. You know what it means to be an academic publication. You know, and the kind of the different timelines and then just a different way of approaching material and networks of you know uh, fellow scholars and you know and this is a very of course very important and uh and like you know you can really appreciate how you know if you're somebody who is working in the field of art history uh you know there you know i don't know 10 years ago there was probably no real centralized journal where you could go for all of this um, material and to even find out who's working on these topics. So journals, of course, play a hugely important place. And it's just that the difference is just that they operate in a kind of uh, different intended audience, perhaps, um, more specialized, more academic. So we're still a magazine, um, which means that we uh, have, are, we're independently published for one thing. So uh, you know, our revenue comes from advertising um and sales so you know we try to yeah you know, get people to buy the magazine get people to advertise in the magazine um that's not personally my responsibility but you know like uh, we have to uh we're affected by those realities um and then also in terms of uh what, what our ambitions are you know we really try to keep up to date with things that are happening uh in a very present and kind of current sense uh so i mean i think the classic idea of a magazine is that it's uh, a resource you know for people to uh turn to to find out like what is happening now uh or what has just happened and you know to get a little bit of like a first take or a fresh take on um uh, you know sometimes things that you maybe know about but um 
Uh, maybe you need to see it again, or maybe you really want to read a review from someone who went to the opening of the latest regional biennial, uh, or who saw a gallery show in Manila uh, and wanted to write about it. So we try to think about how to use all of these different channels that we have uh, in in you know the ways that they're that optimizes what uh, is best about each of them. So, um, you know, we know our print magazine comes out every two months. So that's sometimes good for longer articles like Porsche's article on Imelda, uh, you know, and we got to spend a good amount of time going back and forth, writing and editing and then writing and editing and then thinking about the images. Um, I think also being a magazine, like, we, you know, we, we are a little bit design driven, like, you know, we, we want to have uh, good images. Um, we want to make, we want to show people the artwork. Sorry, this is uh, Imelda's um, portrait. Um, and then, we, you know, we wanted to find some of her older works. Um, so I think we, we, we really think about like how this thing, this paper, Thing sits in your hand and how you're going to read it because you know if we're not going to um, if you're not going to hold it in your hands then you know we don't need to spend so much time doing graphic design and all this layout so that's a little bit of like another aspect of like what makes us a magazine versus you know a journal um, but you know we also do more scholarly things with you know the writers that we work with or we have a, a translation project currently going with Asia Art Archive, where they've identified some uh, texts that have never been translated from Chinese into English uh, by Hong Kong artists and other thinkers from most of the 90s. Um, so we're working with them and publishing that in our regular issues. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I like to think that we're open and inclusive in terms of like our sense of time. Like, you know, we want to stick with the post-world post-war world but uh within that you know sometimes we want to publish something on the same day that we find out about it and sometimes it takes us um a few months or a year um yeah so i guess that's what i would say about inhabiting all these different temporalities um and when i think about the the relevance of digital the digital form to publishing enterprises um there are lots of upsides uh, in terms of immediacy, and there are lots of benefits in terms of, you know, the different corners of the world that we can reach in a very immediate sense. Like, you know, you don't have to rely on uh, a piece of mail, you know, coming uh, into a country and then making its way through a postage system to a door um, or a post office box. Um, but of course, I would, as everyone knows, you know, it's also digital access and connectivity uh, is a kind of blessing and curse. So, uh, you know, we're also fighting for attention anytime we put something out in the digital realm. Uh, so how we do that, you know, the ways we do that, you know, just as an example, like if I show you our homepage, this is the article, this review that we published um, about Wang Tuo, who's a Chinese artist who had a very interesting show here in Hong Kong at Blind Spots. So my colleague wrote the review and then she wanted to translate the article uh, into Chinese. So we put that online. Uh, you know, and then we have to think about, okay, how are we going to get people to come and read this review? So of course we uh, use social media of all kinds. Like, you know, how do we get people to look at our Instagram and click on the link to Look, read the full review on our website. Like, you know, are we going to do this in English or, or Chinese? Or are we going to do both? Um, and yeah, I mean, no, this is a lot of um, maybe oh, don't need to necessarily go too much into this, but it's just interesting as someone who observes, you know, we, we do pretty much the same thing every day. Like we um, post an article online and then we put it on social media. We always put it on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And, you know, then then it, uh, it's once it's out there, the, you know, it depends on all of you who are clicking on these things. Sometimes, uh, you know, our articles are spread far and wide and other days, you know, we don't uh, see a huge amount of engagement. 
uh, it's a little bit of a mystery sometimes. Uh, I would say that the, the Philippines is a very online place. Um, so generally, if we publish content about you know, artists or exhibitions or you know, curators uh, from the Philippines, we see that we're, we're circulating a little bit more in the digital sphere, um, which is great. Um, but uh, you know, the, we, we also don't always know which ones are going to go far. And then I, I'm just showing you this slide because you know, we also suffer from the impact of social media, you know, while it is circulating our material, you know, we're also acutely aware of how, you know, um, all the kinds of manipulation, let's say, that um, social media is is vulnerable to and all these kinds of distortions and also just the ways that, you know, our content is kind of being um, held hostage. So like, I'm, this is just a look at the Art Asia Pacific Facebook account and it's reminding me that, uh, you know, oh, you know, if I want this review to reach 277 more people, I just have to spend $70, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, I kind of ignore these things, but um, it's, uh, it's just a reminder that um, there are lots of issues with the digital space and uh, I also have a lot of issues around um, conversations where we talk about uh, access and uh, and rights on the on the internet because these are private spaces unfortunately uh, so like a, a printed magazine uh, you know you, you have better legal protections and um, more safeguards you know because this is governed by a set of laws that is much more about the public domain uh, whereas once once you take uh, your content and you put it on social media uh, you know you're in a private space and uh, your your rights are generally limited and of course you know surveillance is uh, quite easy for all kinds of people on the on the internet so uh, we're much more wary for example of you know what we say um, you know in a in a facebook post um, I mean, we heavily edit the print magazine, so we're also wary of it here, but, you know, we tend to not to um, have to scrutinize the sort of content of, um, you know, the, the, the print issue versus the online, or it's just a different set of considerations. So, yeah, so I think um, digital connectivity in general um, can be great. Um, just, oh, just to show you that, uh, this review of uh, the show in Hong Kong. I mean, we got about 205 people clicked on this link in, in Twitter, but Japan is also one of these places. It's very into Twitter. So anytime we put a Japanese story out there, uh, we get 10 times the engagement um, just through Twitter. So, you know, we, we, we realized that because our geography is quite broad, like we're really trying to cover um, all of whatever can be considered Asia or would be considered Asia. Um, you know, I always say it's an inclusive definition to, you know, it's not particularized. It's not, there's not a necessarily a stopping point. But so our goal is to really present a kind of uh, big range of activities, practices, geographies, you know, ways of working, ways of being, um, you know, rather than focusing on any particular one um, or any one region or one you know time era or um, yeah and we're based in Hong Kong so of course there's a little bit of a local bias in terms of what you know some of us have access to on a day-to-day -day basis um, but on the other hand you know I mean I lived in in Turkey for a long time for example so uh, you know I'm quite interested and in, connected to the art community there um, you know, other colleagues have experience living and working in other places in the region. So we all kind of collectively bring that those interests to bear. And that's why, you know, we try to keep the focus uh, shifting and, you know, not, not settle down too much in any particular domain. And I think that's really what a magazine need, needs to be is just continually reinventing and sort of opening itself up to new writers, new artists, um, new ideas, new formats even, you know, we've changed the, the way we present materials a lot. 
um, over the years. We've, and that's why, I mean, we, for example, just with videos, it's been another thing that we've done over the last five years that has given us a, just a different way of working with. It's the same techniques. It's uh, interview. It's uh, uh, getting to know an artist, spotlighting somebody. Um, and, but, you know, for us, it could be a, just a completely different way to uh, interact with a different audience, uh, have things out there about these artists. You know, we just did this video with the Hong Kong artist Jaffa Lam, who's not super well known internationally yet, maybe, but, you know, now we have a really nice 10 minute portrait of her studio and her practice. And as long as there's YouTube, uh, we'll, we'll have that video there for people to watch. Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll just end it there. And I, I, my point was more to uh, just give a big survey of the diversity of materials and also just the ways, different ways in which as a magazine, we really tried to um, pursue everything in, in, in kind of all these different directions at once, because, you know, we really don't know what to do at this crux of uh, at this crossroads of uh, the digital and the, and the analog that we're in at the moment. Okay, thank you, HG. It's nice to see you. <laughs> and yeah, definitely that the article on Imelda Kahipe and I, our maps, uh, that was quite a learning experience. By the way, she's here in our yeah. office. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we can like continue the conversation. Yeah, great. <laughs> really nice. Later on as well. And thank you for giving us an insight on uh, the different dynamics when it comes to print and um online engagement so even if you're talking about the let's say the same short the same article there are uh you know very different complicated considerations to have okay thank you hg thank you. thanks now uh our next respondents so let me introduce christine and carla okay so christine l de leon is uh, an art critic, researcher, and educator based in Manila. Since receiving the Purita Kala Ledesma Prize for Art Criticism in 2016, she has written reviews and features on visual art and theater for the Philippine Star and Arts Equator. Her fascination with the shape-shifting figure of the art critic has led her to become part of the first Asian Arts Media Roundtable convened by Arts Equator in Singapore and the Critical Ecologies, Critical Anomalies Collective hosted by Center 42. In 2020, she was selected for Southeast of Now's Emerging Writers Fellowship, wherein she wrote her research on public art and collaboration. Currently, she teaches at the Fine Arts Department of the Ateneo de Manila University while pursuing an MA in Art Studies, Art Theory, and Criticism at the University of the Philippines. She is deeply curious about participatory practice, tactility, and creative criticism. Our other responder is Carla Gamalinda. Carla Gamalinda is an artist, writer, and cultural heritage worker. She teaches under the Fine Arts Department of Ateneo de Manila University and writes for Arts and Culture section of the Philippine Star. In, aside from her formal studies in fine arts and cultural heritage, Gamalinda cultivated her vocation for art writing through the 2015 J. Elizalde Navarro National Workshop on Critical and Cultural Heritage Studies and 2020 Curatorial Development Workshop of UP Jorge Vargas Museum. Recently, she won the 2021 Ateneo Art Awards Purita Kalam de Desma Prize for Art Criticism and was a national finalist for the 2022 Metrobank Art and Design Excellence Painting Competition. Okay, so I think let's hear from Christine first. Hello, thank you, Portia, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, HG and Vera, for your wonderful presentations. Um, it's so great to know how publications right now are um, engaging the regional or this idea of the regional, the idea of the Southeast, and also what kinds of exchanges that um, come from this um, collaboration, um, the regional and the digital. So um, I was listening to HG, uh, HG's talk earlier, and um, I think contrary, and I know we're talking about the digital this afternoon, but 
when I was um, listening to HG's talk, it kind of made me miss print and working in print publications. Um, before the before I applied for the Purita Kalo Ledesma um, Prize for Art Criticism, I was actually working um, in print magazines. And I guess I missed it when HG was talking about how much time they spend working on an article before an article is put out there in public. So he was talking about Portia um, and him working on the article on Imelda Kahipe and Daya. So it's, I think it's kind of normal at these, um, in, in, at these times to have a certain nostalgia for print, especially when digital tends to be a little confusing. Now that we have issues of AI, issues of NFT, um, I do miss the kind of certainty that was brought by print and also the sense of having time, taking your time, especially when you're working in a magazine. And also with Vera's presentation earlier, um, what I loved, uh, what I love about contributing for Southeast of Now was that um, the thought that I have, um, the thoughts that I put out on art, it's always mediated by a historical perspective. And I think that's also something that is given that kind of sensibility or temporality is also given by print. Um, with digital right now, HG was talking about engaging with um, social media engagements, Instagram, knowing how to engage an audience that is continuously scrolling um, on Facebook feeds and Instagram feeds. There's, in a way, there's a kind of instantaneousness in the digital domain. Um, there is pressure, I think, for an art critic to respond right away. So when we're writing in the digital space, there's this sense that you are sharing the space with other, um, other businesses, other publications, other intentions. I think there is also, I guess, the pressure for an art critic um, to resist this temporality of the instantaneous or to resist this temporality of the hot take. I mean, I'm, I'm coming from my own practice because um, when I think about or when I practice art criticism, for me, what, what I love most about art criticism is that it is an introspective practice. And I know because we have a lot of mediums, we have a lot of um, a lot of format, like for example, Instagram and Spotify, maybe we can, we're going to see the future of art criticism in the form of a podcast, maybe a round table podcast or art criticism as an Instagram story, no? um, Instagram uh, art criticism as content. Uh, maybe we're going to see iterations of those in the future. But me, as a, as, some, as a writer who is kind of nostalgic, still nostalgic for the print days, what I really love about art criticism is that, for me, art criticism is a writerly intervention. Um, and Vera started her presentation earlier saying that sometimes criticism gets a bad rep. Sometimes we think that an art critic is the adversary, the rival of the artist. But in fact, um, as an art critic, I enjoy the pleasure of writing. And for me, it is the same as the pleasure of making. Um, so I think art critics as writers have so much in common with artists. And uh, the other thing I want to respond, uh, respond to when Vera was um, presenting earlier, I did get to think about um, um, the Emerging Writers Fellowship by Southeast of Now because I was very fortunate and privileged to, uh, to have participated in that in 2020. And in 2016, I was a, I applied for the Purita Kalo Ledesma Prize for Art Criticism. So I think those were um, four years. Um, um, 2016 and 2020. So it also got me thinking about the format of the open call. 
the format of the open call as a way to practice as an art critic. Um, I think about the open call because it is in a way a digital, um, digital gave us access to so many open calls, open um, calls for submission, call for submission. In a way it's a, um, it's, these are, th these open up opportunities to practice. And I'm thinking about how the digital space has made it easier, not just to find these, but to find transnational networks, um, regional networks. So um, it also got me thinking, when I applied for these, the Purita Halo Ledesma Prize for Art Criticism and the Emerging Writers Fellowship for Southeast of Now, what, what, what is usually the motivation of an art critic or an art writer? when she applies for these um, opportunities. And I think it has to do with training and practice, having the opportunity to both get mentorship and at the same time to practice in a very public domain, which training and practice for me, it, they're two of the things that are very, very hard to juggle or very hard to balance when you are young and when you want to get, get into this. Um, to get into this field. I think, um, I think there are so many art writers, there, there are so many writers who want to write about art in the Philippines. Um, when I hear people saying that no, there are, there's no one, there's no one writing about art, it's just, I don't, I don't agree with that because I think it's not really a matter of how many people are writing, but how accessible are the opportunities to write? And how do we create these conditions to write? Um, I think the challenge really is sometimes we lack training or sometimes we lack practice. Like I know there are um, art studies graduates, for instance, who are trained to write about art at universities, but once they graduate, um, sometimes there are few opportunities to put their work out in public or to, um, to work as a, as an art critic. Um, on the other hand, there are also, for example, journalists who are continuously covering art and culture events, but they also seek training and opportunities to specialize. So I think the open call format, like what Purita Kalo Ledesma, the Purita Kalo Ledesma Prize for Art Criticism is doing, it's a good opportunity to get mentorship at the same time to practice. And it's a, it's a very, um, it's a, there is excitement at the same time, there is so much, there's productive pressure in that. So I think this also opens up the question of labor um, and uncertainty when it comes to practicing as an art critic. Um, an art critic, at least as I've known uh, the art critic, it's in a way an art critic is, is a freelance writer. Um, it's very, very, very rare to find someone in the Philippines whose full-time job is an art critic. Um, the only way uh, for the practice to be sustainable is when you fulfill other roles. Like for example, an art critic as an academic, an art critic who also doubles as a curator, an art critic as a crucial worker and a museum staff. And I think, it's because we're trying, we're always wrestling with the challenge of how to balance practice with the sustainability of the practice. That's why when I was listening to Vera earlier, um, it really resonates with me how the academic context, the academic journal is in a way um, a means of supporting the art critic. So um, I also thought of in the Philippines, um, there is the art critic Alice Guillermo, who would write in, uh, who would write art reviews in mainstream media publications. But then she, she held a job as a teacher. Uh, she taught art history at the University of the Philippines. So um, I'm very, very interested in how um, these, fields or these domains come together in the practice of an art critic. Um, the domain of the journalistic, engaging um, the public through maybe a more accessible language or a more playful language. And then 
um, being rooted in the academe, being rooted in the discourse, and also um, relating to the art scene in the Philippines, which is, of course, exciting and also very challenging. So it makes digital connectivity also very promising because um, it's one of the support systems for how an art critic can practice. Yeah. Um, so maybe if I can just ask, I have I had just one question um, to ask uh, either Vera or HG, um, because both of you are editors too. Um, I'm interested to know um, how do you edit um, art criticism or articles on art when um, and it's coming from a different country like the Philippines or what are your considerations when you edit um, a piece of art criticism? Hi, maybe I should go first. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for, for your response, Christine. It's, it's yeah, it's really wonderful um, to hear you talk so sort of passionately about, about what you do and um, the other different platforms for it. Um, in terms of editing material that comes from different countries, I think that's where um, the strength of our collective, our editorial collective really comes in. We all have specific country expertise on at least one area in the region, but we are very much in conversation and conversant with each other um, and sometimes have really wonderful disagreements among the collective, but it's not um, an individual process, thank goodness. Um, when I started the journal, I was a very, very emerging scholar, so I wouldn't have trusted <laughs> myself to make um, such big decisions, but um, we learn from each other in that way. And I think we also seek the advice of our mentors and our editorial advisor, advisors. And I think that generational approach has been very crucial for us in terms of the process of the journal. Yeah, uh, thanks, Christine, for sharing all those reflections. Um, yeah, I would say similarly, I mean, uh, you know, no one is really an expert, uh, but what uh, you're trying to do with a writer is just, I mean, usually the writer is actually the expert, but, you know, as an editor, I always feel like the goal is to try to get all the things that the writer wants to say, uh, whether it's about an artist's practice or about an exhibition, you know, just help them to see, you know, how far they can take whatever they're, they're writing about. Like, so it's just about asking good questions. And oftentimes it's because you are curious, like, you know, this is why I like editing an art magazine because, you know, I'm always like, okay, I want to read about things that I don't know about, you know, who can we find to write about this thing that I cannot otherwise read about. Um, so then when I get a text, I'm like, okay, great. I don't know this artist, you know, let's see what has been written about this uh, practice before, you know, and does the, the essay or, you know, the, the article really get to some sort of fundamental question about um, you know what is engaging and interesting and captivating and relevant about this practice so I don't see you know the way I see it is just like oh I have to try to ask good questions of the writer to see if they can share more you know I want to hear more I want to hear you know um, a more detailed description or more information so um, yeah so I think that that's the really the role of any kind of editor is just trying to get the maximum out of, uh, of the writer's expertise onto the page. And, you know, you can be helpful with that by first of all, asking the right questions. And then later, yeah, there's some cosmetic things that you can do with organization, you know, language, but really the first thing is just, you know, let's try to get it all out there and, and find out what everything there is to know about this topic. Yeah, that's, thank you, HG and Vera. Yeah, that's, re that's really um, interesting to, to hear about because sometimes when people read art criticism, they assume that um, it's the views of only one person, but it's um, the practice of art criticism. It's an editorial practice. Um, it's a collaboration between the writer and the editor as well. And even the editor, Editorial, um, the editorial part of it. That's also one way um, to have mentorship. Um, when you're, especially when you're a young writer, just hearing the input, the feedback of your editor, it's um, that's such a valuable contribution to our practice. Yeah. 
Okay, so maybe we can hear um, Arla, yeah. Thank you, Christine. And I think, yeah, let's hear from Carla so she can join in the conversation as well. Hello, hello. It was a pleasure listening to all of you. So my mind is racing with the ideas right now. Uh, I think it's best to introduce my background first so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, again, I'm Carla. I consider myself a happy in many aspects. So I'm a digital happy meaning I am old enough to have spent most of my early years in the analog format, but just young enough to be still able to catch up with most of the emerging tech right now. And I both write about art and make art and teach art along with Pristine and Ateneo. So multi-hyphenated, just like how Pristine described us. No? So my ideas and observations are coming from this perspective. And I agree very much with Vera about the benefit of increased reach or readership when on the internet. For me, it goes both ways. When my articles in the Philippine Star are uploaded to the website, I can see my writing reach new audiences like far beyond the limits of um, tangible print, especially the generations who are no longer subscribed to physical broadsheets. And at the same time, as an art writer, I get access to unknown art on the internet, art beyond the radars of established gatekeepers. It's mostly through Instagram. Uh, this is important no, as an artist, uh, also as curators, because we get to survey the landscape. Uh, as much as I value visiting physical galleries, my social battery can only handle so much. No? So it's, it's very important to browse the internet for me. But uh, like what HG mentioned, uh, this increased reach is a double-edged sword because posting on the internet means you get reactions beyond your intended audience. Uh, one of my earliest recollection of a viral artwork in the local setting is a show in the Cultural Center of the Philippines in 2011. Uh, the title is Kulo. And one specific installation gained so much traction in social media and mass media. It's Politeismo by Mideo Cruz. A Porsche wrote a good article about this and also his new exhibit. No? He also wrote the CCP article, right? The CCP encyclopedia article. Right? It's, a, it's a good piece. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it was 2011, imagine, which is for me like the dawn of the internet age here. It's like 5 a.m. soft light, just a few people awake. And this piece by Mideo Cruz, it's a three wall uh, installation of like various everyday objects, right? Signages, movie posters, uh, public and religious icons. It's like a pictorial of, a uh, pictorial survey of a, of Philippine culture. It's like pictorial survey of Philippine culture. So the part of the installation that drew most attention is this one wall with a huge cross that is covered with those images along with condoms and ashtrays. So before the internet, I feel like this installation would reach only art patrons, art students, and they would interpret it as like a proper commentary on the complexity of the belief systems of a modern Filipino. You know? And after the show, they would discuss it among their peers and then continue with life. But this time it went viral. Uh, of course, the church stepped in and Sabing Annie Portia in her article, it was even juxtaposed against the reproductive health bill, which was the current hot topic back then. So the reactions were wild. I remember being a fine arts student in a Catholic university back then. And they held the mass to lecture us artists about how wrong Medeo Cruz was. So there was a flood of criticisms, criticisms from people who I doubt no, tried to, I, I doubt even tried to understand the artwork. Like sumakay lang sa band level. So increased reach is a blessing and a curse, as HG said. Yeah. Um, but another good thing no, about this shift to 
digital is that it allows new formats. So I was browsing through the website of Art Asia Pacific and I came across this beautiful video about uh, artist Jaffa Lam. He mentioned it earlier. Uh, it's a nine, 10 minute video wherein the artist talks about her work. And what I love about this video and this format no, is that it allows the artist to use their own voice, literally and figuratively. Like being able to use her own voice is extremely important for artists. And behind the scenes, I imagine it was a collaboration right, between the producer, the cinematographer, the writer and interviewer, which is HG, right? Uh, who probably wrote the questions and directed the conversation. So in the video, there's a, a lot of footage of the artist in her studio. So she gets to show us her tools, her process. And the way it was presented, it, it feels so natural as if you're having tea with the artist. So it helps dissolve this, this wall of exclusivity and elitism when talking about art. So I love it. And then while she's talking about uh, her work, the editors would splice in footages of her work while it is being activated, activated or um, exhibited. So as a viewer, I get so much more information, so much value. These new formats are uh, a huge advantage for artists and art writers, I think, because we, be, because we get to maximize the, the image, to get our ideas across. And we get to experiment with creative presentations. Because online, there's almost no limit to how many photos we can use to accompany our works. Uh, compared to like newspaper and print, which is very limited real estate. Aside from this, I noticed that uh, writers on the internet are forced to make themselves more understandable because maybe we are more aware that we have a wider audience now. So we use lesser art speak. That doesn't mean that we have, ha we have to dumb things down. No? I know a lot of talented writers who use simple words to send powerful thoughts. For me, it's like dressing down art into jeans and shirt. And that way it's like easier to insert art into the daily lives of the people. So another format that fits seamlessly into our lives was mentioned by Pristine, uh, the podcast. I imagine if a person talks at the rate of like 150 words per minute, or it's a 150 words per minute. So a thousand word article or a thousand word art review can fit in like a seven minute podcast, right? That's the length of two pop songs. I think UP Vargas does this, right? Uh, Vargas on air on Spotify. So they do it really well. Uh, lately, I was reading one of the articles in Southeast of Now. Uh, there's one by Kiko del Rosario, also a PKL finalist. And he wrote about Lito Mayo. And I love how it was written. I can't help but imagine his writing being read as a podcast. Or better is video no? with prints of Lito Mayo and you zoom in to the details. So there's so much potential in these new formats. On Instagram, I'm, st I'm starting to see art reviews in the form of reels. And I imagine these could be like gateways to deeper, deeper learning. Like, for example, after seeing the one minute reel, we can lead people into more rigorous research, into more academic discussion. I mean, like, that's the dream. But of course, with the success of like Instagram, of this democratization, we also have to deal with the explosion of content, which brings us back to our speaker's point about the value of proper criticism for the health of an art scene. Like when this democracy in content making reaches its peak, people will start to depend on institutions like publishers and museums for guidance on what is good. So for me, the role of institutions now, like the PKL, uh, becomes stronger than ever. And so 
there are a lot of pros and cons no, in shifting to the digital. And there are a lot of issues that we need to address. But if you ask me, it's a clear yes to the power of the internet. I mean, it's not as if we can stop the shift, even if we wanted to. Right? I'm just happy to see that all of us here, especially your speakers, who hold so much influence, acknowledge the legitimacy of the internet. Because the internet is real. It's made up of real people, aside from the AI, sorry, and real thoughts, real communities. So I am actually secretly annoyed at people who undermine young you who undermine like younger generations for like, wasting time on the internet. To those people, lang, if you're listening, time to stop belittling us. Because one of the most important ideas that I have observed uh, from being in the internet is that there is enough space for everyone here, especially in the art scene. When new formats like these emerge, it doesn't mean we have to actively make old formats obsolete. I was in awe listening to Pristine earlier, appreciate the slowness of print. I was like, oh, man. So we can exist together. And the options are exciting. No? As an artist and as a writer, it's, I think it's an amazing time to be alive. So thank you for letting me share my thoughts on this. Back to Portia. Okay, thank you very much, Carla, for uh, that insightful uh, you know, context when it comes to local culture. And uh, okay, um, before I ask questions now, um, for the audience, please, you're welcome to ask the questions. We have uh, people monitoring the Facebook Live. And then we also, uh, for those who are here with us in Zoom, um, feel free to use the question box and then I'll guide the questions or ask the questions for our, for our speakers. So please, we'd love to hear uh, more of your questions. But I guess to get the ball rolling, no? um, if I may ask, like everyone, what have you observed when it comes to the shifts in terms of art criticism, particularly in the past, let's say, decade? Uh, as Carla mentioned earlier, I think it's one of my earliest uh, works and articles on Medeo Cruz and this and Politimismo. No? And it was uh, a very different internet back then where people like uh, get together in joy or in fury of something be before the algorithm that we really have now. So I think in terms of the local and perhaps the regional, uh, maybe you can share your insights on this topic. Um, who wants to begin? Um, maybe HG? Because since because of the popular nature of art Asia Pacific. Thank you for calling us popular, Portia. <laughs> um, how, how has the, uh, art criticism changed in the last 10 years? I mean, yeah, I think that uh, as all of our speakers have been saying, you know, uh, Carla and Christine also just emphasizing that we have so many more uh, opportunities to uh, to write about the things that are interesting to us or just to present you know the the material that we come across in the world uh you know to our friends and and also to strangers um you know so i like to think that you know on the, on the one hand while you've got this uh these all of these incredible digital platforms where you can really personalize the material that comes towards you and offer immediate feedbacks or or not i mean you know like the the whole concept of like throwback thursdays is always funny to me but uh, you know, I like the, the way that people share old photos and like, you know, they're because some people are like, oh, the digital only allows you to do things immediately. But it's like, no, I mean, you can also just take the digital to be whatever you want it to be. I mean, it's your literally personalized space. Um, and I think it, there's something to be said for, you know, the rise of like, you know, very considered more academic publications, you know, and uh, at the same time as all of this digital publication uh, because you know clearly both things there was demand for both things you know there's a demand to synthesize knowledge and spend a lot of time with it and have it sit with 
a, a collective of specialized people who really are engaged with the subject and you know that didn't exist 10 years ago you know i mean we have to remember that art history did not really deal with contemporary art even 15 years ago i mean and most Western art historians are still only writing about sort of art in the mid 2000s. I mean, that's their knowledge is like up to Anish Kapoor, you know, that's oftentimes. So it's like, you know, art history is, is um, and just as a field, it was always traditionally slow moving. And then once you introduced a kind of different regional geography onto this kind of very Western, you know, European uh, American uh, industry or complex in, in the academy, uh, you know, that was a really, uh, a big step for a lot of people and for me it's amazing to see how in a very short amount relatively short amount of time uh, you have regional journals you have people who are specializing in like non-western modernisms you know like programs networks you know like all of these scholars and all of these institutions now um, are rushing to catch up um, and uh, and are just uncovering incredibly interesting things connecting new partnerships with museums uh, it's happening in so many different levels and you know of course I think actually a place like the Philippines probably uh, has um, like a longer tradition of continuity in terms of like having a really deep academy all these different schools you know modernist art scenes that were quite cohesive uh, you know but there are other parts of the world uh, where you know the for of course it, it, lots of different history historical reasons uh, there hasn't been the same level of continuity or, or domestic scholarship or so, but it's great when these things can then interact at a supranational level as well, you know, so maybe that's uh, what's exciting also about engaging with the Philippines is like, oh, jumping into this discourse where it's like every time, I, you know, I read about an artist from the Philippines, it's like, you know, you guys know him or them, you know, or her, like, you know, their practice, you know, but from the outside, it's like, yeah, we don't know them yet, you know, we're, we're, we're just jumping into this incredible lake of, you know, decades and decades of an art scene uh, that have been in discourse with each other. And then, you know, so for me, a place like the Philippines is all about, you know, like, you know, how can we like share this material and connect it to other practices, whether regionally or internationally, and, you know, make new friends with all this great uh, historical material. So I think that's been a huge, huge shift. And I would just say that, you know, like, the the just the technology has changed the way that we can connect with people i mean just this event you know i mean uh, we're all in different places and you know and then all of the audience are somewhere else and then it's going to live on facebook amazing thank you very much each year um, even the speakers and panelists are not even in the same place and like me and carl and christine we're in the same country but we're generally not in the same <laughs> location as well um what about you vera when it comes to more like uh, academic writing like with the internet the interactions with the internet how did it shift in the past decade yeah, I mean, just to echo, I mean, I'm, it's so wonderful everyone talks so positively about it because I must say I'm a little curmudgeonly in <laughs> being um, sometimes a little bit maybe resistant or slow, you know, to technological changes. I think it's really exciting in terms of the proliferation of resources available. You know, like I only learned recently how you can upload a PDF and have it like automatically translate material. I mean, that would have helped so much four years ago at the beginning of my PhD. Um, so things like that, I think are really amazing. Um, you know, things that you would have needed to go to a country for to look at in a library now, someone can send you a Dropbox link. I mean, that's amazing. Also, but I do think it makes me a little bit cautious around um, putting stuff online just because the internet never forgets. And I think, you know, um, talking to sort of emerging scholars and, um, critics sometimes there is a sort of reticence to, to post the material online just because you know comments boards can be quite vicious um, and although they can be constructive they can also be quite petty so there's a kind of double bind I think between the sort of openness and circulation and then the kind of um, yeah as you mentioned the kind of flood of criticism good or bad um, that can happen so what I quite like I mean I think um, for example Art Asia Pacific I, which I've written for years and years ago have like such incredible editors. So that sense of professionalism and 
support and safeguarding is really wonderful in terms of the material you put out there that it is really nice to have you know um platforms where um you feel like you're not alone in presenting material you feel like the material that you're presenting has been checked and edited and also um yeah fact, you know fact checked and that kind of thing so that if something comes at you you have a protective mechanism um yeah because i think sometimes the sort of barrage of um comments sections can be a little bit intimidating so i guess that's my main you know um i guess shift in observing how uh, people absorb material and can get it from anywhere um, and what material like really esoteric material you can find online now it's quite incredible and you know like all those people that upload journals from the early 1900s and digital I mean thank you whoever you are like please continue to do that that's amazing as a researcher and on the other hand uh, a kind of wariness around really putting yourself out there knowing how big a readership is I mean even learning that Southeast of now had 95,000 downloads I mean even you know as one of the editorial like my god if I which I will publish in the journal as well you know thinking around like the sort of vulnerability involved in that scale it stops it from being sort of I guess a more sort of regionalized conversation to something quite exposing um not that wide readership is a bad thing per se but it, it, you know it's something to grapple with in terms of having your work out there and kind of scrutinized Thank you, Vera. What about you, um, Christine and Carla? Any insights, like let's say, on the past decade? Have, what have you observed locally? Or even um, should I? Um, yes. Yeah, I, I guess for me, um, the idea of the art critic and just criticism in general is being, I guess, kind of um, blurring with other fields and responsibilities. I'm thinking about the art critic as also the art curator. Like we have seen instances of that, art historians who are also art curators and critics who started as writers and then went into curation. So I think the curatorial turn in art is also affecting um, the writing that is being produced. And I know that, um, for example, journalism is just one strand or one track for an art critic to go to. Um, in, in in curation, writing is also a in a way a curatorial function. Um, writing is also a curatorial function. So I think it's challenging the idea of an art critic as an autonomous entity, of an art critic as very distant, or a, an art critic that is very someone who is very autonomous, um, distant from the art scene. The art critic as the outsider. I think that paradigm or that stereotype of the art critic is already being challenged now. So um, the art critic, I mean, like Carla here, um, she's she's an artist. She's also a critic. So I guess it makes me question who can we really delineate this position of art criticism? And when Carla was mentioning um, when she was talking about the possibility of a podcast, I was thinking, what if a podcast is a roundtable discussion between, for example, the five of us? How will editorial intervention come into play? Um, I guess it's one of the things that um, is being challenged right now. The way that we do criticism, the way that we do writing through these collaborative and digital processes, it's getting us to question, um, is art criticism really a singular separate entity or is it does it merge with the other things the other responsibilities that we have towards the art um the art economy that's a it's a good ob observation uh sometimes i think that the art critics role is uh like what you said it's um evolving maybe instead of just being in front of the computer in front of the 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 keyboard maybe uh, the role of an art critic can be like what Porsche is doing now like the a moderator for for uh engagements like these right uh, but to answer Porsche's question uh, of the difference of how I observed the internet 10 years ago you know uh 
earlier I described uh, 2011 as like the dawn of the internet here. I feel like now uh, it's the rush hour, <laughs> like rush hour in EDSA. And it's good for us. No? In the Philippines, you're big internet users and almost everyone creates content now. When you ask kids, uh, they'd say their dream is to become a blogger. And it's a legit dream already. Uh, now, imagine if we could engage at least a part of this demographic in art criticism, in art criticism and art conversations. No? I think this shift will help us fulfill the roles of art in the society, like the, the really important roles. No? And that's that's. Thank you, uh, Christina and Carla. Now, the role of uh, the art critic in society. That maybe we can, uh, well, well, before I do that, now, if there are, again, uh, questions from our audience, either from FB Live or here with us on Zoom, just like type away and uh, let us know. But uh, Carla gave that opening on the art critic and society, particularly in this uh, you know, very vulnerable, open, online society. How, how do we view that? Particularly, well, locally, you now maybe Vera and each you will have different perspectives here, but yeah, we're, we're multi-hyphenated local. I don't know if anyone is actually like sole art critic, art critic, curator, academic, writer, educator, etc. So it's partly practice, partly, Practical, right? Uh, I'll be honest about that. Also practical, so we can get to have like a more stable, you know, take ourselves out of that precarity uh, in terms of labor. Uh, it could be quite that unstable, right? So perhaps uh, we can give an insight. Oh, there. Uh, when it comes to our perhaps social responsibility amidst all this, uh, you know, conversation in terms of art criticism and art writing. Uh, who wants to maybe wear? Yeah. For me to start. Um, um, so in terms of the multi-hyphenate roles, I mean, yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I, I I guess I define myself as an art historian and a curator um, and that anything I produce, I guess, kind of comes under that position. Um, yeah, I mean, both of those fields are ones of a conversation, essentially, and I've been very fortunate to, you know, um, to have really great mentors and to um, to really learn my trade by enmeshing myself in, in scholarship. Um, and how crucial that has been, but um, I think I think it's really fascinating the direction art, that that actually within art criticism there's a kind of inclusion of art historical work or artistic research um, because I think yes yeah, as you say those roles were more delineated um, when they first emerged but due to practicality um, we can't really have them so separated um, but I, I I think one of the the fields I'm fascinated at looking at is actually more, particularly when I worked in Southeast Asia, was um, artists entering um, and contributing to art history and art criticism as well. And so this kind of um, collapse as well between um, making, consuming and producing art itself and having um, an insight into that as contributing to the field, um, as well as kind of retaining, I mean, as, as much as, as wonderful as the internet is and giving insight into practice, you know, I'm also, I guess, a, a certain hesitation or wariness around, um, yeah, the direction of criticism and short, short form or short attention, you know, clickbait kind of material as getting um, more attention. I remember reading something, um, I think it was a review of, a, of, a, of um, the Bill and Biennial from last year and being in this review, I think it was in, I can't to remember to be honest I think it was in freeze but I remember being like messaging a few friends being like wow that was so mean <laughs> you know um I I felt I felt like I hadn't read something like that in such a long time and then uh, a friend and colleague who also writes for that magazine was kind of like saying yeah because there is more competition now for publishing platforms 
particularly prominent ones, that often um, writers will take a really strong position to differentiate themselves from other writers. I think I thought that was a really interesting strategy, but also one that maybe somewhat dangerously plays this kind of algorithm, algorithmic, algorithmic kind of impulse, right? To to be quite present within the conversation through a certain reflex, which for better or worse, yeah, alters the landscape of criticism. So just some thoughts there, I guess. Um, thank you, Vera. Um, I guess uh, before we run out of time, I think it's uh, related to the question of social responsibility and labor as well. Uh, we have a question here from Martha Gripa. Now, where have you found professional mentorship during your early sorry, it moved, uh, during your early years in writing? And what opportunities are there for practicing or hopeful art critics? when they are no longer young enough to apply for residencies or mentorship programs. Um, can someone take it on? Um, maybe HG again? Uh, sure, yeah, I mean, I, or mentorship. I mean, I think I worked for a bunch of um, small online publications in, in New York. Um, when I first graduated from university and I was also doing, I think I was also working in a restaurant and I was like, you know, I wanted to write, but I didn't know how to write or what to write for. So I would just write for all these like free newspapers or like online, uh, you know, pub short publications. Um, and uh, yeah, and of course I didn't make any money doing that. But um, so that, that was kind of, this kind of scrappy informal way that I got into to writing about art and I I don't know how many of these platforms really exist anymore but I would just say that uh, compared to those days I think you have a lot more opportunities to do your own art writing you know um, you know on your own terms like I think it's um, it's very accessible in terms to, to just if you want to write about things like you can easily make a writing platform for yourself whether it's on social media or not it can be on a you know third party site like medium or one or you know any, one of these um sort of micro blogging sites so i think if you are really considering um and i think you, and i think you can also find ways of sharing these things and people will read them because i just you know if i'm looking for information about an artist i will often come across you know independently published materials uh, by people that I don't know and sometimes they're really good or sometimes they introduce me to a writer that I don't know so I, I always think it's of course about self-motivation and interest um, and I think if you put yourself out there in you know of course in respectful ways and curious ways and like generous ways in terms of interacting with your subject matter um, you know then then you will get feedback and um, you'll also find communities like I know somebody who uh, here in Hong Kong, who is, works more as a curator, but he has a great Instagram account where he writes in English and Chinese, and then he's got like a kind of circle of friends that he's built up over the years who also contribute to, you know, what is an Instagram account. Um, so, and that was a totally DIY informal community. And then once in a while, they have social events where they get together and discuss topics. Um, nobody's a professional, everyone's doing other things, but you know, they kind of created their own community. So I think there's a lot of potential. Um, yeah, and I, I don't think age is a barrier or necessarily experience so much as just, I don't know, being motivated and sort of dedicated to this. And then, um, yeah, like a, just briefly about very negative reviews. I mean, I think it's an easy way to um, not be generous in engaging with a subject matter. Um, because it's easy to be cynical about things. And it's also once you work in the professional side of the art industry, you kind of learn too much about, you know, how, how things and institutions work. Uh, and that can uh, give you a lot of license to be very cynical about things. But um, I think it's important to be critical and to point out, you know, problems, you know, and, and that Berlin Biennial, you know like was very controversial for a lot of reasons and you know the ways they framed certain artists practices 
with others, you know, with or without the consent of those artists. I mean, it was very problematic for a lot of people, but there were just ways of talking about it that were just disruptive or destructive, or also really tried to consider like, you know, a curatorial approach that was quite different than maybe uh, an approach that the artists were comfortable with. And it raised all these other interesting issues, which are relevant for all of us. Yeah, so I distinctly remember the title being something like more boring than watching paint dry on a I don't know. <laughs> it was crazy. It was no, very she... memorable for that, for the angle, for the tone, you know. <laughs> but I'm still talking about it, so obviously effective. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you very much. I think we have one last uh, question, you know, uh, because uh, we're, you know, a little short on time, but you have this interest. Um, I was bringing up the role of the artist in society earlier, and I think it's uh, the way tangential to that. Uh, we have a question from Jay Bautista from LD Live. Um, do you think the art critic is still influential in these day and age now that art collectors have been the recognized arbiter of taste in the art market? Um, what what do you think? Yes, Carla. I go first. Yeah. For, for me, uh, I think we have to take note of the difference of the role of the art collector and the art critic. The art collector is mostly on the market, right? It uh, considers the monetary value. They consider the monetary value of um, artworks. That's like the the main uh, concern. But for art critics, I think they tend to focus more on like the questions that the artwork brings. Uh, what uh, kind of solace, for example, this artwork brings to a society that is mourning, for example. So that's it. I think we we have to add on. We have to look at art as having different values. There's monetary value, and there's uh, different kinds of social values. Thank you, Carla. Maybe, yeah, Christine, so we're the local context as well. Maybe everyone can share their insights on this one, on the role of art, of an art critic vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, market, or vis-a-vis -a, -vis a lot of these uh, <laughs> labels that we have now. Yeah, um, I also agree with Carla. Um, I think it's a very provocative question, <laughs> um, the question that we received. And maybe I can answer with something um, simple. And um, I want to say that art critics are not social media influencers. Um, art criticism does not have to influence everyone in order for it to be necessary in this ecology. So I always see art criticism as a mediation or an intervention. Um, when it's an academic journal, you intervene with by contextualizing it um, through history, uh, through art history, bringing in discourses, bringing in context, bringing in questions. So it's never just a matter of asserting our opinion. It's never, for me, it's never about the verdict. It's never about whether an art is good or bad. It's the process, the thought process that you have in order to get there. And I guess for me, art criticism is less interesting as a way to advance an opinion. And for me, art criticism is a way of introducing a way of reading, a way of seeing a work. So in that sense, it is a mediation and not just a verdict or a judgment. Just to clarify also, no, I, I am not saying that art collectors do not see the social value of paintings peaceful. Uh, it's just that there are, I'm trying to emphasize that there are a lot of uh, values that we have to consider. That would be something to think about. Um, quite an interesting, albeit uh, provocative question. No? Uh, maybe Vera, like Vera and HG, maybe hear from you uh, on the more regional context, regional global context. 
Okay, okay. Uh, about uh, value. And I mean, I don't think I've ever written something and thought to myself, oh, this is going to, you know, kind of increase the value of, uh, of this artwork. Uh, or, or or by contrast, you know, it's never dissuaded anybody, I'm sure, from uh, buying things. Um, no, I, I think the function of it is more to propose uh, the function of art criticism is really to propose like what is interesting about this artwork, you know, from, you know, your perspective, whether it's personal perspective or just more of like a, you know, perception of the, of the moment of the place that you're in. And you're trying to explain this and articulate this to anyone who might be reading this text. And, um, you know, you're making an argument for, you know, why there is some, something is interesting positively or negatively, but, you know, worth discussing. And uh, that just doesn't always, that doesn't dovetail with value very directly. Um, sometimes it coincides, you know. Um, sometimes you see very expensive art and you think to yourself, "Yeah, that's that's still really interesting and great," and I'm glad that people value it. Uh, and then a lot of other times you're like, "Wow, that is a lot of money for something that I just cannot see any worth in," you know. Like so, but even saying that probably wouldn't dissuade the market. So. Yeah, we should just we should just leave those two to one side. But then again, like lots of I mean, lots of collectors are very invested in their artists and uh, in, in the things that they buy, and they buy them because they really love them. And uh, you know, I think those kinds of collectors, you know, are tend to be really interesting people to talk to and full of knowledge, and you know, in their own way, um, are are as passionate as uh, as some critics. Vera, do you want to weigh in or do we want to take on the next question? I think, yeah, I think that covers it beautifully, um, <laughs> both of you. So, yeah, we can weigh on in the next question. Okay. Um, and one last, rather interesting question from a Aileen Legaspi Ramirez. Uh, um, Christine points to the very muddled borders, the intersections, multi hyphens, and tightly networked fields in which criticism circulates. How might readers be helped somehow, though, in spotting when writing is coming from a problematic or non-reflexive place? Because murky conflicts of interest might be at play. So I think it's something that uh, uh, has, you know, something that we've all encountered in the practice of art criticism. Uh, Vera. Yeah, and um, Eileen Sonnell Editorial Collective, so so nice to hear from her. Um, I think, you know, I think this is really the responsibility of obviously the writers, but the editors of these of various platforms and doing their due diligence and professionalism um, and making sure that there are questions to contributions and to authors. And, you know, I think something, something I often find uh, frustrating is seeing a review of an exhibition that's clearly written by like a close friend of the person or the curator or the artist. And I find it really some, you know, you can read the kind of bias quite obviously. And I think I think that's where um, we all have a responsibility in upholding standards to each other actually um, and, and pointing that out or and questioning it. Yeah. Um, anyone else wants to weigh in on this? Ah, yes, Carla. Carla, your audio. Sorry. Hello, hello. Uh, for me, I just try to uh, not not to write about my own work. You know, in, for example, uh, the broadsheet, if I'm given the chance, I, I try to avoid that. I let other people uh, write, for example. So. That's the simplest answer I can get for being multi-hyphenated as an artist and as a writer. So I try to avoid conflict of interest. I think I, I think also just to weigh in on this slightly uh, in a contrarian way, I think it's 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 also hard to uh, be totally detached and like uninvolved in. Um, so I think you have to ask yourself, you know. Uh, well, from your side as a writer, let's say, you know, you have to be honest with yourself, like, you know, how much can you say that's that's truthful? Like, if you're truthfully excited about uh, an artist's work, like, I don't know, I mean, I, you know, I might know this person, or I might have socialized with someone and then, you know, be very excited about their work. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree that there's definitely when it comes to certain commercial practices, and it's it's not nice when you see the networks of people and the way things are being promoted. But I guess I would always try to say that, I mean, it is an editor's responsibility. And even when working with a text, like um, I would always push someone to not promote things. Like the point of art criticism is not to hype something by saying like, it's amazing, it's good. You know, like this is not like the language of art criticism. It's like, you have to tell people why it's interesting. You have to convince me as a reader that like this is that there's some like intrinsically interesting thoughtful substantial beautiful you know whatever it is uh that, that's really in the work and you know that is always goes at odds with any sort of promotional language you know so um, if you're serious about writing you know you, are, you already have to leave that kind of thinking behind Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, Christine, sorry, did you want to weigh in on that too? Um, oh, um, well, um, echoing HG, I think one easy way to spot um, a non-reflexive piece if it's full of superlatives, <laughs> like the best, the excellent, the, the canon-making kind of rhetoric um, that is easily um, recognizable as PR language and a, a refusal to problematize the position of the artist that you're writing about. Um, I think reflexive pieces are able to flesh out the determinations, um, even if those determinations implicate the art critic as also suspect or um, the art critic as also in one way, one of the, um, the, arts, the art critic's position as something to be problematized. But I also want to maybe just a last point. I also want, I also think it's interesting that contemporary art challenges this position of distance that critics are coming from. Um, before, with um, wall-bound works, for instance, or museum shows and gallery shows, it's so easy to be distant. But for example, with practices such as um, so socially engaged art practice, research-based art practice. Sometimes it's not enough to just um, look at the documentation. And it's very interesting when you're a critic who is also there collaborating with the artist. And when you're a critic who's writing, you also have to problematize your own position when you are a collaborator. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christine, and thank you everyone for your wonderful presentations and how oh, wonderful and your uh, insights when it comes to the discussion. Right, uh, I think yeah, the the art critic is not necessarily the influencer here, and you know you don't necessarily have to affect market market conditions but the more on reflexivity so uh, i love how our discussion uh concluded okay so earlier uh, vera presented a more scholarly approach to art criticism and art writing both in online and uh, on publication uh, as well as hg more in regional magazines and but at the same time still engaging with various social media platforms and of course christine and carla for presenting this very local uh perspective when it comes to art criticism and you know, this very specific context that we have in the Philippines. So I'm sure there's plenty more to talk about. And hopefully this is a conversation that will keep going. Uh, not, not just, you know, this is more of like a starting point for this, uh, uh, for this conversation. So thank you, everyone. Um, can I call on Bootser to close? Um, hi, wait, let me just, okay. so thank you. Um, thank you for that uh, insightful and engaging uh, presentations and, and conversation. Um, and also thank you to uh, the, the, the attendees who sent out their comments and questions. Um, 
it, it was interesting to, to understand and to, to be aware of um, the many pl platforms for art writing today, both analog and digital, and the professional directions writing can take us and take and which you all the, the guests today you know, have shared. Uh, while we acknowledge the advantages that uh, the digital technology provides, especially when we were all on lockdown, um, it is important to maintain a degree of caution. And um, the, the idea of, of having this conversation uh, brings us more um, to, uh, brings us to, to further um, assess the viability and even the importance and, and the advantages and disadvantages of different platforms. So thank you again um, to HG and Vera May um, for, for um, making time to join us this afternoon. Uh, it's already early evening here. And to Carla and Christine for your insightful uh, responses. And of course, to, to um, uh, Portia for uh, moderating the session. Um, we hope to um, uh, set up or, or, or organize another uh, similar um, online session as part of a series of talks. Uh, uh, and as we mentioned earlier, this is in celebration of the 10th uh, anniversary of the Purita Kahlo Ledesma Prizes for Art Criticism. And so um, we would like also to, of course, I'd like to just um, give thanks to our program partners. Um, the Purita Kahlo Ledesma, uh, the Kahlo Ledesma uh, Foundation, uh, represented by Nana Osaita and Adam Abilangan, who's one of the attendees today. And um, of course, our pro, uh, publication partners, Art Asia Pacific, uh, the Philippine Star, and Katipunan Journal. Uh, we would like also to uh, remind um, our listeners, our attendees, that uh, we are still the submission for the uh, for this year's Purita Kahlo Ledesma Prizes in Art Criticism is still open, um, and it will end on before the midnight of June 30. So um, we look forward to receiving more um, submissions, and um, we will be working soon with our program uh, publication partners for the eventual deliberation and selection of winners. So thank you again and good day.